Halo. Hi, um, Sabina Martin, can you hear me? Okay. So I guess we will just maybe wait for a minute for the other participants um, to join in. Let's see at the moment of the all right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we have um, Shella. Shella has joined. I believe she is from WWF South Africa. Hi, Shella. <laughs> Hi. So um, we are just giving a minute or two for um, the rest of the other participants to join in online. So, so far um, online, I have my two colleagues with me from the Potsdam office, Martin and Sabine. We have one more person. Let's see. Ah, we have Anna Lamik also online. Hello, Anna. Okay, so I'm not hearing any background noise yet. I will only be able to hear the other person when I unmute um, their microphone. So, yeah, don't worry, I'm not hearing anything yet. Are you at a construction site, Shola? Aha, uh -huh. okay, noted.
So I'm just going to give it another minute. Um, I'm not sure about other participants, but I know that in South Africa, most of us are, are preparing for the holiday tomorrow. So some people might be running late because maybe they will finish early in the office uh, today. So I will just give it another minute and then I think we will start. Um, we have a good number so we can continue with our conversation. We also have Louise joining us. Hello, Louise and Mulegua. Okay, so I think I think that this is the perfect time to start. We do have a good number. The rest of the participants can join in on the conversation as we go along. So, uh, welcome to this webinar, which will be taking a look at. Uh, how we can um, strengthen collaboration in the time of the Sustainable Development Goals, looking at how perhaps the Dialogic Change Model can help us um, do that. And we'll also take a look at a few cases that we have worked on as an organization um, in the last while. So, um, yeah, so as I said, my name is Lulega, and with me, I have my colleagues from the Potsdam office, uh, Martin, who will be helping us with the technical side of things of the webinar. And I am also joined by Sabine Heckman. Sabine will also be joining me in the facilitation of um, the, 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 the webinar. Okay, so let's see. Okay, um, let's test it again for the next minute and then see how we are, but before then we had checked the connection, it was quite good, so give us feedback. Okay, so um, just before we start uh, briefly, I would like... Uh, okay. So, Martin, how do you suggest we go about the technology challenge? Okay, noted. Okay, so before we start with our uh, seminar, um, I would like to hand over to my colleague Sabine to just say a few words about who she is and the role that she plays at CLI. I think it's also important for us to hear the voices. And after Sabine, Martin will also go ahead and just say hi, and then we will dive into our webinar. So Sabine, I will quickly hand over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I hope you can also see me um, because it's snowing currently in Potsdam. So greetings from Potsdam, um, Collective Leadership Institute. So I'm project manager here and especially in the areas of capacity development for multi-stakeholder collaboration processes and also for the impact measurement and also research and especially since 2015 I'm advising civil society actors 
in the design and implementation of multi-stakeholder partnerships for the sustainable development goals here in Germany, but also abroad. So, and in this regard, I'm also working closely with uh, my colleague Lulikwa in South Africa. And um, CLI was um, founded here actually in, in Potsdam. So Potsdam is a city uh, close and next to, um, to Berlin in Germany and a very cute city and lovely to work here. So that's from my part currently. And my camera, enable my camera. No. Um, <laughs> it should work, the camera. Um, this is um, a technical challenge. Um, I don't know. It's uh, to me. It's that it's working. That camera. So I don't know why the camera is not. Good. So that's currently from my side. Um, I'm sorry if I can't see myself. Um, I can send you a picture afterwards with my lovely face. Um, um, however, as Martin already said, some technical instructions. If you have questions or anything, you can write them uh, in the chat itself, and Luliqua will afterwards include you um, also verbally. Um, with um, um, with her technical aspects, um, yeah, that's from from my side um, here in Potsdam, and I hand over to to Lulikwa back. Martin, will you just say a quick hello to our participants? Ah, yeah, hello, <laughs> that's me. I'm working in the background. Actually, also in another city here in Germany. So we are in three different places, which makes it technically not so easy. But I think we can go ahead. And uh, the most important thing is that uh, the Lequa can work uh, with the charts. And I think we have now maybe 30 to 40 minutes presentation and afterwards also time um, yeah, for questions and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And now we go to our webinar. So a little bit about myself. My name is Mila Guatema. I am based in Cape Town, South Africa's um, CLI office. Actually, to this week, I've been with CLI for five years. And I have recently um, assumed a new management role um, within the organization. So this is also an interesting space and time for us in terms of our work um, that we want to do in the country, but also the work that we are doing um, globally. And then back to CLI, as Sabine has said earlier, we were founded um, in 2005 in Berlin. So our documentation will say we were founded in Berlin because that's what is on the founding document. However, there is a dispute to this. Um, the Collective Leadership Institute idea came when the founder was actually in South Africa, in Cape Town. So Cape Town is the original birthplace of CLI, but we do not want to um, fight with Germans. So we will give this to them that the organization was founded in Berlin in 2005. So what is it? that we do as an organization. Um, so our aim is to support people like you coming from various sectors um, and in creating and implementing um, collaborative change initiatives. Um, and obviously, these should be geared towards um, sustainable solutions. That's why we are in business as an organization. So what we would like to see as an organization um, is that, you know, um, we have this group of people or organizations or communities that are future-oriented, 
that are also leading collectively towards a sustainable future. We also believe in the principles of cooperation. I guess that also comes from the name of the organization, which is the Collective Leadership Institute. And we also believe in collectively created solutions across sectors. And this is why we are always drilling the message of um, collaboration as an organization. So, um, enough about CLI, you can also always um, um, visit our website or contact us via emails um, to learn more. But how did we come up with the idea of having this seminar today? So, um, at the beginning of the year, as an organization, we were reflecting on the work that we've been doing over the years, but also the kind of work that we've been asked by others, by our partners, other um, um, organizations or government to do with them. So from that reflection, what was clear for us was that um, we are operating in this space as an organization because there is still a growing interest around multi-stakeholder partnerships and how they can actually bring about sustainable solutions to the challenges that we are facing um, globally. And for us, that is well and good, but for us as an organization, to be able to be happy with ourselves, we add an extra layer to that interest in multi-stakeholder partnerships. We are saying that these multi-stakeholder partnerships, they have to be conducted in such a manner that they produce more than just results. And we also say that it is important how we conduct these multi-stakeholder partnerships. That's where we talk about um, the concept of you know, process quali quality and also focusing on the quality um, of the whole process. And this is where the dialogic change model comes in which is a model that we've been using as an organization and it's also a model that we are continuously drawing on whether it is insights whether it is feedback from our partners or whether it's new lessons for example that are coming up from using the model and then we thought um, as an offering because we're also working within a community, whether that community is a global uh, community or it's a local, it's a regional community. So we thought, let's have a conversation with a few people and really focus on the idea or um, the conversation on strengthening collaboration in this era of the SDGs. So this is why we are having this uh, webinar or conversation today. So, a quick look at um, the SDGs. We have 17 of them, and there are so many other things that we want to do in the world and that we should be doing. But I think these um, 17 are the top tier ones that are, are urgent, that really affect our uh, ways of being and how we conduct business, whether it is a business of working with community, whether it is a business in the sense of profit making. But these 17 ones are the ones that most governments have agreed that in these 15 years, these are the targets that we want to reach in respective of these um, SDGs. What we've also seen as well from the requests that are coming from our partners is that um, when, when our partners come to us um, wanting to get into uh, uh, cooperation agreements or working relationships is that they come to us saying, Mulegwa, these are our, this is our mandate and this is how it relates to the SDGs and these are our targets. Is there a way CLI could help us in achieving A, B, C, D, and E under these SDGs. All right. So we have 17 of them, but quickly looking at particularly SDG number 17, which is basically why the Collective Leadership Institute exists as an organization. 
So our understanding of that goal, which is partnerships for the girls, is that multi-stakeholder partnerships create transformative effect for the achievement of the sustainable development goals through lateral, lateral collaboration. So if you know, if you have interacted with us as an organization, is that our language involves uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships, cross-sectoral partnerships, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. So this is what we do as an organization, and we take that goal seriously because we also feel that <laughs> it has um, it has saved us a lot in terms of communication, you know, in trying to explain to everyone what is it that the Collective Leadership Institute is doing. Sometimes when we do our one-minute pitch, we just say, we are SDG number 17. So this goal is also important because what we have seen is that even if um, um, a partnership of organization, for example, let's say, is looking at health, Usually, it's not only about health. We usually see that education perhaps becomes part of achieving that goal, which is another goal. We also usually see that, um, you know, the creation of jobs, you know, economy also forms part of that goal. So it is really important that we pay attention to the quality of our partnerships. And the big question is always how. So, Mulega, can you give us a formula in terms of making sure that we conduct our partnerships in this high quality um, manner? So, just looking at multi stakeholder partnerships again, um, so it can be any kind of a partnership between. Um, uh, two or more organization and this partnership it could be just you know a combination of different organization within the same sector sometimes it involves other sectors as well and I think um, with our lessons our experiences and also tough lessons that we as an organization have also learned in the previous years is that it is really important to include everyone that also has a stake or that plays a role within a particular goal that um, a particular partnership is trying to address. And what makes this partnership is that whether all the different parties are coming with different mandates as different organizations, but they are somehow connected by this common goal. So that has to be apparent because then that makes it uh, a partnership and some other characteristics that makes this a real partnership is that um, you know it is ca characterized by collaborative decision making and implementation because we we know that it is not a partnership if it is just driven by one part by one party or by just one organization so um, how other actors or partners are participating it is important we should really pay attention to that and that has also come up in the work that we've been doing in the last two years when challenges would arise in the spaces that we are working in because um, sometimes the intention would be that this is a partnership but in reality in action it would look um, different than a real partnership. Okay, so now that we have taken a quick look on the SDGs and we also want to see how do they connect with the dialogic change model, a quick look at the dialogic change model. So our dialogic change model really it's it's, it's nothing new, but it is information and experience and expertise that has been packaged in a manner that we can actually use and apply. So the biology change model, also um, the first word would um, give way to how it is dialogic. It follows human ancient knowledge of dialogue. Our work as an organization does focus on dialogue, how we connect um, as humans with each other because at the end of the day we may come as these big organizations but at the heart of it 
we are still humans and we do believe in meeting others as humans. So the model is also based on the organization's experience in supporting change processes. We are doing the work that we are doing as these organizations because we want to see a change, um, a change for the good. We have, for example, organizations like the WWF, working globally, tirelessly, working on campaigns, working with communities, working with other organizations, but also even working with um, government and business because they are hoping that we get to a point where we change as um, the global community and perhaps start thinking differently about the planet that we are occupying, whether it's about animals or the environment and all of those things. So at the heart of all the work that you are doing, it's because we want to see change. The model also, it provides a guided approach uh, to the preparation and implementation of stakeholder dialogues and collaboration. But for us, and the feedback that we get from our partners is that um, the result-oriented uh, approach to it, it really works for them. So it has this structured planning and the implementation of your process. And um, when you've been part of our courses, or if you are going to be part, uh, take part of our courses, you will see that um, within each phase, there's also guiding questions for each of the four phases that helps whoever is driving um, the process. We continue, okay, let's see. It seems like we have lost um, a couple of people. Okay, maybe due to the internet um, connection. So the biology change model, it has four phases. Um, those phases are mainly exploring and engaging, building and formalizing the second phase. The third phase uh, being implementing and evaluating. The fourth one, developing further, or replicating or institutionalizing. So with, with this seminar, we are going to focus um, mostly on the phase one, because it, it was also part of our reflection. The work that we are supposed to be doing at the beginning of our multi-stakeholder processes, especially now that we are actively, uh, uh, you know, declaring to the world that, you know, these are the SDGs that my organization is focusing on. We found that um, it is important that we really spend the time that is needed and we really pay the attention that is needed. This also, I guess, applies to the uh, overused example of building a house that um, a house is as good as its foundation. So I guess we would then look at phase one of the dialogic change model as the foundation. So how do we make sure that foundation is really strong so that it can carry the house so that the house also can last for, you know, over hundreds of years? Okay, so phase one. We have three elements in phase one. We talk about creating resilience. We talk about understanding the context within which we are going to be working in. But we also talk about building a container for change. And what do we mean by these three elements in phase one? And what is phase one also about? What can we expect um, you know, from having gone through phase one as um, a partnership project. So some of the expected results from phase one, we see that um, we say that um, trust should emerge among the key stakeholders that would have been identified. And one of the results also should be the credibility for implementation. Because if you have gone through your phase one in the manner you should, then the credibility should also emerge. Participating stakeholders should have been identified. You do not identify your stakeholders only when you go to implementation. 
but also um, one of the results should be the context and external influencing factors explored. What will affect your your process? You know, have you covered all the angles to make sure that your process takes place? And we usually get to the question on how long does phase one should take? And our answer to that is it depends on it depends on um, the particular project, what it is about, and the complexity of the project. But we see that your phase one could take anything from a minimum of two months, uh, perhaps to over a year, because some projects might be so complex that your phase one really would take longer. So the principles of phase one is that you get the conversation and you get the system into a conversation with itself and you build relationships and you bring um, you build a um, strong container. So when we talk about, excuse me, when we quickly look at what a container is, so when we talk about a container at CLI is that um, other people might uh, relate to the container as uh, perhaps like the driving committee of this particular project or the task team or maybe a working group but a container it is that um, small group of people that are making sure that the project is going as planned that group of people that are making sure that all the steps that should be followed are being followed and are paying attention are paying attention to whatever matters they, they, um, they may arise. But what is important and what we need to know about this container is that um, it has to be representative of the system. For example, if this project, this multi-stakeholder project we are working on um, includes organizations from civil society, it includes government, it includes business, it includes, um, say, international donor community. So this container must be representative of all of the sectors that are within this project so that they are also able to give feedback to their respective um, organizations or, or companies. Um, we stress the building of relationship and um, ensure that people get to know each other, whether it's formally or informally. Ensure that people understand um, the role each and every organization is, is, is playing and also ensure that um, the people within this project are able to meet as um, humans and show also that all the voices um, are heard um, within the project. And so with, with this phase one, we do have an example of, um, of work that we did in 2017 that we thought perhaps maybe could also um, share some light on how to apply the phase one of the dialogic change model um, in a multi-stakeholder process and we are going to take a quick look at that example. So this is the case of Kenya which had an intensive phase one. So last year we worked with an organization called Maltesia International. This is an international relief organization um, that is operating in more than other countries um, in the business of helping people affected by poverty, disease, conflicts, and disasters um, nationwide. So Malteza, they looked at the work that they are doing, and especially in Kenya, and then had this idea of um, convening a multi-stakeholder partnership that will include various actors and various, um, in this case, the two countries, Germany and Kenya, whereby it would look at um, specialized health professionals initiative, which would be um, a multi-actor partnership 
whose intervention is aimed at improving the availability, the deployment, and also conditions for um, selected specialized health professionals in Kenya. So what is interesting about their case and how it applies to phase one is that they realize that okay, this is a big project and it's going to be complex and therefore it is important for them to build a solid foundation so that when they get to implementation they know that at least they have covered themselves so our role within this initiative and within this idea was that um, we were approached to assist in conducting a feasibility study that was going to look at the conditions for this initiative. So whether the country was ready, whether there were enough partners, uh, and whether these partners were also interested. So remember, with phase one, we have those three elements. Um, we say you should create resonance, you should understand the context, and you should also build a container. So, we went to Kenya and conducted the feasibility study as an organization, but we were also doing the same in Germany because not only was this going to be a multi-actor partnership, but it was also going to take place between Kenya and Germany. So what was interesting and also um, inspiring for us was that Maltese International took um, their idea seriously for change, that they had to do it right. So the feasibility study we could say that it, fell, or it falls under the understanding the context um, element. Not only did we do the feasibility study, but we were also invited to facilitate um, a kickstart workshop. So after the feasibility study was conducted, they looked at the results and then they worked on their proposal, which was awarded to them by uh, BMZ um, in Kenya. So now the kickstart workshop, um, it was looking at the core team in its planning um, uh, stage where it was going to center the initiative on the true principles of a multi-stakeholder approach. So as we said earlier, that uh, phase one is also important. So for us as an organization, we see ourselves still working um, quite a lot in this phase with our partners because this is where you build a foundation for a project. I think we've just lost someone again. Okay, so this is where you, 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 you build a solid foundation um, for your project. This is where you set the tone. This is also where you get to understand um, if there are dynamics that might affect or impact your process um, negatively, uh, for example. And then we move on to phase two. So phase two is about building and formalizing. So if you are now um, certain and satisfied that you have done enough exploring and engaging of your key stakeholders or all the relevant stakeholders that should be part of this initiative, this is where we then recommend that you go to the next level where you are taking your partnership live, you bring it to life. Here we look at clarifying the common goals and resources. Each partner that comes in into a partnership, uh, it comes in with its own mandate that may be different to the next uh, partner. This is where it is important that we clarify the common goals for this particular initiative or partnership and also resources. This is where we also iron out things like um, who will bring what, you know, how much are we bringing in, whether in terms of skill, whether in terms of financial resources, or even if, um, you know, there's time uh, that is required. In some cases, we see different partners coming in with, uh, with uh, offering, for example, office space, um, where, you know, um, 
the partnerships could actually utilize throughout the period of the initiative. We also recommend that you plan the future together. Planning the future together also brings this to a true partnership. And we also recommend that this is where you actually consolidate your agreement and you establish a structure. What we have seen before is that um, some initiatives rush into signing agreements without really doing enough um, engaging, without doing um, enough, um, without creating enough resonance, or without really understanding the context within which they'll be working on. So that is phase two. We will share with you a case um, that we worked on um, in Zambia, which is a perfect example of what a phase two um, looks like. Okay, let's see. We skip that. So what, what we emphasize with our partners is that um, it is important to find the common ground, you keep the common goal clear, and you plan the future together. And what we see is that when our partners feel that um, you know they are included in the process, ownership develops. And we also see that uh, people actually will implement something that they've been part of. So it is really important that you plan the future together. Okay, so um, just a little bit on the phase two as well. This is where you might, depending on your partnership, this is where you might be creating expert groups or task forces, and these would look like at content details all the difficult issues and will bring results, uh, for example, from task forces back into the larger group for consideration. Okay, so we are going to skip that. We are sharing this with you. So, Lucy is the Lusaka Water Security Initiative. As we said earlier, it was a perfect example for a phase two, how a phase two should take place, and if challenges do arise, how they are handled. Okay, and we skip that as well. So now we are going to be looking quickly at um, phase three, which is about implementing and evaluating. And this is where I am going to hand over to my colleague Sabine to just take us through a little bit um, on phase three and how phase three also connects uh, to strengthening the SDGs. Okay, so Sabine, over to you. Yeah. Hi again. So, um, as Lulikwa said at the beginning, so the key to achieving tangible results to its common goal um, through multi stakeholder collaboration processes and dialogue um, is not only joint development and pl planning, as you described in phase one and two, but also the implementation and the evaluation of the results. So, phase three um, can be seen as the actual implementation um, of planned activities and includes establishment of an internal um, stakeholder collaboration monitoring system in order to ensure results and learning out of the phase one and two. So um, phase three actually focuses on creating visible results. So, and that is done in a reasonable time frame, and it's done for all actors involved so that they can see the success of the collaboration and the dialogue. And it's um, crucial that um, the actors involved um, perceive also the visible change during the dialogue process. Otherwise, they might lose interest in the dialogue and in implementing change. Um, so results orientation is key for the success of a collaboration process, especially in multi stakeholder partnerships processes um, for the SDGs, which are very complex and very dynamic. Um, can you move on, Lou, with a slide? Or can I do that? Um, I... 
Oh, sorry, I can do that, didn't know. Um, so as I said, um, multi-stakeholder collaboration processes um, and dialogue uh, for the um, uh, sustainable development goals are very complex and dynamics. And this complexity is, um, of a process often comes, becomes evident during phase three. So it shows how different um, stakeholders use decision making. Um, so um, it needs patience and consideration for difference among stakeholders um, um, and this is very, very important um, in phase three. So the core group or the container um, should be responsible for the communication and keep the common goal clear. Um, the objectives summarized over there are as I said, so implementing agreed up and, and recommended, recommended activities, um, create showcases for change, evaluate the progress and also the outcomes. So phase three um, can take actually months or several or years and is concluded when the agreed up and goals have been reached. Um, let's move on to the next phase, which uh, a slide which summarizes the important principles. So um, in phase three, um, the dialogue or the collaboration needs sufficient structure and attention to value-based relationship management and goal, goal clarity. So it's, um, it's important to ensure the transparency in the communication. Um, it's a continuous communication of process and, and this is of utmost important. And so making the process as transparent as possible for all staggered is crucial when you are implement and um, um, yeah, when you implement a multi-stakeholder collaboration process. Um, furthermore, it's essential to highlight those as achievements of a collaboration process. For example, you can create uh, prototypes um, that are visible to all stakeholders and also um, actors who haven't been participated yet. Um, so it's um, create results and also celebrate the success. So um, stakeholders they stay engaged when they can really when they can really relate to the joint success and uh, when they can also overcome the difficulties um, of a situation. So and as it is highlighted here, um, the success should be celebrated where it's possible and appropriate. So um, this is a, a very important principle of phase three too, as well as, as I already said, the establishment of learning mechanisms. So um, some, to establish some form of learning mechanism, for example, the procedure for monitoring and evaluation is crucial um, because um, you want to change something and you want to change through learning and um, during the implementation phase it is therefore important that you do it jointly um, how you like to implement such kind of um, evaluation and learning mechanisms for your stakeholder collaboration um, so there are also some, some kind of mistakes um, that are mentioned here as, for example, that you implement your process not uh, jointly and there's a missing structure that comes out if you haven't done phase two uh, well, for example. Or if you haven't also not uh, created a good communication between um, all the partners involved when you um, implemented um, your plans with two ambitious um, goal sets and that you can't reach um, the achievable, um, yeah, the, the envisaged um, um, goals together. Especially a crucial things, uh, thing that I experience is also the lack of transparency. So the hidden agendas and the, the communication that takes place um, behind the walls and behind the doors. And um, so take care of that when you go through phase, um, phase three. Um, we, had, um, we had supported um, also the African Cashew Initiative. So um, there are around 2 million African peasants who produce around 40% of the world's 
cashew. And um, cashew nut production is an important source of income for many smallholder farmers. But there are several challenges also, um, like, for example, few economies of scale and production and marketing um, due to weak farmer organization or also limited access to necessary support, for example, through technology or also the lack of political support. So um, it is said that uh, many African governments have realized the importance of agro-processing industry for sustainable economic development. Um, nevertheless, um, the majority um, of exported raw cashew um, is um, perceived to um, India, for example, and not done in, uh, in the countries itself. So um, the objectives of the African Cashew Initiative is to strengthen global competitiveness of cashew production and processing. And this started it in uh, 2009. And during the first two years of implementation, there was a considerable effort um, into building alignment between the different partners. So this is um, phase, phase, phase one, actually. Afterwards, um, um, they become the structure in, so for strategic learning and also innovation and um, also the establishment of different management retreats. So, and all of this served to enhance um, the identification of all partners with the common goals. So, um, a very important part of phase two. And um, the alignment of the implementation activities. Um, together, afterwards, they um, jointly monitored the success and they did it through a regular progress report combined with the intro introduction of a learning and innovation meeting that has been uh, facilitated by different um, stakeholders and that strengthened the cooperation or the collaboration between all, um, all actors. Um, and um, yeah, um, CLI supported this initiative and guided the implementation process in phase three. So um, that's, let's see what's going on here. That's the result actually. So between 2009 and 2010, CLI acted as a convening facilitator and expert advisor and provided process support um, to the development organization, the GIZ especially. And the result is that um, since 2009, um, 200, no, 414 uh, farmers are trained and 214 peasants have directly benefited from the African Cashier Initiative. Um, they received, they have an increased yield per hectare, an increased annual net income and a higher employment rate. So um, that's, that's what comes out when you do a good collaboration process and a complex fault for sustainable development. Um, I, afterwards, there comes the um, phase four. Um, phase four is about uh, developing um, a process further or replicating or institutionalizing um, certain structures. And here it's um, Lilith again who comes in to explain what's, what's about that. Right. So, um, what we usually see is that um, most of these partnerships, um, they conclude in phase three after implementing an evaluation. But some of these partnerships are usually producing such good results that there is then an interest of um, taking whatever model that has worked in a certain area and replicate it in another area. So when we look at phase four, um, developing further or replicating or um, formalizing whatever the initiative was about. So this process is also quite important and what we usually um, alert to our partners is that please um, spend enough time in building a proper container. So remember in phase one, when we were talking about building a solid foundation for a partnership, is that it is important that now in this phase, phase four, you build a proper container for scaling up and you also embark on a rich 
and um, sufficient engagement uh, process, particularly where you might need to be integrating new stakeholders into your partnership. And we also say that um, contextual needs or requirements for institutionalized and professional management structures need to be paid attention to. So are you going to have a management structure? Uh, are you going maybe to register this initiative as a formal organization? Will it have, um, will it serve as a secretariat? So all of those important details, they really need to be um, paid attention to. Also look at whether you will need to adjust the strategy because you will be adapting results of um, a process that took place in another time or in another place. Okay, so a quick example here, following with the Lucy example from phase two. So there are phase four as an um, initiative resulted um, in a strengthened multi-stakeholder team, which is composed of individuals that have an increased um, respect for one another and uh, are joined by this common goal. And the process that also led them here was that now Lucy was launched as a formal initiative. Um, there was also a signing by um, the respective partners that are forming the Lucy Water Security Initiative. And there was also an organization within this partnership that then volunteered hosting its secretariat because now it was back into their ownership from being housed at GIZ. And then there's also a formal board that sits and look at how the initiative um, operates and whether it also follows the strategy that also gives advice, um, strategic advice into the implementation process. And um, the only one process is that now this Lucy collaboration um, is implementing a strategy that was also developed uh, by the partners. So in these last few minutes that uh, we are left with, um, what we want to say as the Collective Leadership Institute, um, as an organization, is that Paying um, enough attention for your beginning phase of your um, multi-stakeholder partnership is really important because that will also determine. And we have seen the dialogic change model helping our partners doing just that. And what is also um, good about it is that if a, a, a process is already on phase three and then we realize that perhaps uh, you know, something changes or maybe the context change or you realize that there are other stakeholders that should be integrated into the process. It allows that process of going back and saying, ah, okay, let's add this number of stakeholders because now we see that they should be part of the process. So that is really important. And um, the work that we're doing is not easy because also when we come together, as different organizations, we come as different personalities. Sometimes we come, and therefore, that might just be, you know, the mixture for conflict. So it's not always easy the work that we are doing. But what we say is that the dialectic change model does give you a chance. Does give you initiative a chance to make sure that it is strengthened, it starts right, and it can actually um, increase its likelihood of um, succeeding, and which is what we want. So we have come to the end of our webinar, and we are open to answer any questions that you may have. You can contact us via our website or via um, our emails, if you have them, which are also listed on the website. We do have um, some more detailed offering of what we do as an organization uh, through our courses. We will also share that with you. And yeah, connect with us. We are on social media. Um, connect with us via emails. And thank you so much. Any closing comments from my colleagues? 
उसका दो नंबर थे good nothing from that side well um thank you so from the collective leadership institute and my two colleagues thank you so much we hope that this has been helpful for you